John Giannetto, can you just come up um, here for a minute? Okay, I think we'll get started everyone, seven o'clock. Uh, welcome to this ordinary council meeting. My name is Karen Ribbon. I'm the Mayor of the Town of Gawler. Um, firstly, a statement of acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge this land that we meet on tonight is the traditional lands for the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the greater Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. So roll call. I haven't received a, an apology from Councillor Vallalonga, so if we can put him down as a non-attendance at this stage. We have got an apology from Councillor Brian Samble um, and everyone else is here. Are there any um, motions to grant leave of absence, councillors? There be none, and we have no leave of absence. Uh, so, okay, so public, we'll go straight into public open forum. Sorry, I just did it. Yeah, yeah, I've just done that. Oh, here comes Jim. Hello, Jim, welcome. Uh, okay, so we have uh, 11 people who wish to speak um, this evening in public open forum. I'm going to give people two minutes each. Um, I'll give people a 30 second warning so that uh, you are aware that there's 30 seconds left. Uh, there's quite a number of people, so we'll take questions at the end. So if you are speaking, can you please sit up the front in case there's any questions at the end rather than all the way at the back? Because otherwise it just, I don't know where you're sitting, I can't see you, et cetera. So um, if, if, if speakers wish to come forward and sit at these seats at the front, please, uh, so that it um, makes for a really smooth transition. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so uh, I've got this in order of um, uh, the governance officer uh, has, Jordan has written down, thank you, Jordan, for that. So first cab off the rank is Kath Warhurst, um, SEAP Working Group Chair. Thank you, Kath. Just turn it on, thank you. There you thank go. you, Mary, and thank you, councillors. As Chair of the Climate Action Working Group, I urge all councillors to support Motion 16.4, enabling the full council to address the SEEP at a special council meeting prior to entering caretake mode. A tremendous amount of work has been done to create the SEEP at the request of you all, the current members of this council. From the early days where we had no, no data to fires to pandemics, so much has been achieved by the working group and council staff over the last three years. This plan has received ongoing support in the chamber and there is so much to be proud of. This plan is positive, practical, realistic, responsible and flexible. It's serious about mitigating climate change risks to our community, yet it's flexible enough to adapt to future changing circumstances. Due to unfortunate scheduling, this plan is at risk of not being addressed prior to entering caretaker mode. The Climate Emergency Action Plan is a legacy achievement of this council, or will be. The community has shown overwhelming support in the recent public consultation phase. We owe it to our community to repay their support and their hope. I hope and pray you will make sure that we clear this final hurdle. Thank you. Thank you, Kath. Our next cab off the rank is Jack Gill, Climate Action Plan, Emergency Action Plan. Thank you, Jack. 
Thank you, Mayor Redman, CEO, elected members, council staff, and those with us today in the gallery and on YouTube. I'm speaking at, at similarly in support of item 16.4, the Climate Emergency Action Plan, and I echo Catherine's comments. It should be a no-brainer that the action plan should be endorsed by this council, given it was this council that passed the Climate Emergency Declaration, that funded the seat, engaged with the climate strike movement, advocated to the local government associations in state and federal capacities, and supported the community garden, to name a few achievements. This document is part of the legacy this chamber supported and contributed to, and will be utilized in the years to come by the future generations of elected members. Additionally, the feedback for the SEEP for the, from the community consultation was extremely supportive, recognizing that operational and carbon savings, both councils and households, can be achieved by sustainable technologies and transitioning to a decarbonized economy. The community members of the working group has also provided a significant amount of support in the development of the plan. Nearly once a month since August 2019, for two to three hours, we've met to discuss the various opportunities council and the community have to drive down emissions. That's a significant amount of time volunteered by myself and the other members and demonstrates the commitment we have towards the community, the town and the environment. On a personal note, I have been involved in the seat preparation since the beginning and have been very grateful to have been included as a youth and community representative and honored to have contributed towards a document which will support council in continuing its 30, legacy as a lighthouse. 30 community. seconds, thank you, Jack. Thank you. This, this experience has enabled me to go to Melbourne as a town of Gula delegate at the Climate Emergency Summit, where I participated in discussions and shared ideas, engaged with ratepayers at the Sustainable Living Festival and engaged with council and staff and elected members unlike I have before. I will always be proud of the climate emergency action plan that we have developed and look forward to seeing it in action. Thank you. Excellent work, Jack. Thank you. Jade Hancock, Chair of the um, uh, Youth Advisory Committee, speaking about the climate emergency action plan. Hi, I'm Jade and I am the current chairperson of the Youth Advisory Committee. Um, I would just like to start by thanking Mayor Edmund and all staff and councils in attendance. I'm speaking in support of Motion 16.4, the Climate Emergency Action Plan. A lot of the youth advisory members, past and current, have worked on this group, myself included. And I would just like to um, show my support for this action, um, for the action plan, along with the rest of the youth of the advisory committee. And I think that is thanks to action plans such as the one that Gawler has presented to council, that Gawler is a, an amazing place for youth to live, work, study, and play. Thank you. Thank you, Jade. Well done. John Bolton, a Climate Emergency Action Plan. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on country that is the land of Australia's first nation. That is to say the nation of Australia, which was created when we federated in 1901. And I welcome those who are not Australian to my country. There is no climate emergency. Stop wasting ratepayers' money on it. Climate commute, computer modelling output is not the result of magic. Computer models are human made. What comes out is fully dependent on what theoreticians and programmers have put in. Just a few days ago, Thursday last week, over 1,100 scientists and professionals gathered together to try to take the politics out of this. They say that scientists should openly address their exaggerations in their predictions of global warming. Politicians should dispassionately count the real policy costs against imagined, the imagined benefits. Earth's climate has varied as long as the planet has existed. And we have natural cold and warm phases the Little Ice Age only ended in 1850, so it's obvious that we are now experiencing a period of warming. And it's warming that is far slower than has been predicted time and time again. Global warming has not increased natural disasters. There is no statistical evidence that global warming is intensifying hurricanes or floods or droughts and other natural disasters or making them more frequent. Climate policy has to respect science. 30 and seconds. Economic thank, you, John. thank you. Climate policy has to respect science and economic realities. There is no climate emergency. 
There is no cause for panic or alarm. There is no cause for urgent treatment. On top of that, it's impossible for Gawler to make any difference whatsoever. So stop wasting race pay, rate payers' money on it. Thank you, Mr. Bolton. Um, Sue Goodwin's Aspire Housing. I'd like to come forward, Sue. Thank you. I'm actually speaking on behalf of my daughter and son-in-law, um, Steph and Benny. They're sitting in the audience. They're too distressed to speak to you tonight. I'll just give you a bit of background. They are two people who want to live in this Gawler Council region. They got married last March. Steph went to Trinity College. She's a graduate of the local school. She's a nurse in Lyle McEwen Hospital and has been working there since she qualified in her nursing degree. Steph and Ben got married in March last year and then decided that they were going to build a house together. They looked for a block of land, which they found in the Aspire Housing Estate. And in September last year, they put their deposit down on their block. They then went and sought um, builders to be able to build their dream home. They moved into home with my husband and myself so that they could um, save and make sure that they had um, financial stability to be able to purchase their own home. I'm not sure that the issues around um, the release of the titles for the land that they have purchased have been brought to council's attention. In fact, I read the 68 pages of the minutes from the last council meeting, and I couldn't find anything in there that really referred to this issue. So I'm not sure what the issue is. My son and daughter uh, in law, uh, daughter and son in law, um, 12 months later, still have not got the title on the block of their land that they were hoping to build their dream home on. The grievance is not between the individual land purchases. The grievance appears to be between council and the land developer. 30 seconds, thank you, Sue. I'm really concerned that the, the local, um, the individual parties are being drawn into a grievance that is outside of their control. The council will um, take action and do what is needed, but it's the ratepayers that are gonna pay for any action that happens. And that grievance isn't between Steph and Ben and the council. Stress and anxiety. Steph's a nurse. She's been working as a nurse for, the, for all through the COVID period. And add to the stress and anxiety of being a nurse has been um, significant on both of them. Um, they, they've had a handbrake put in their lives. They can't start a family. They can't move into their dream home. They're still living with mum and dad. And as Steph said to me the other day, I don't want to have a baby when I'm living with mum and dad. I think it's immoral. I think what the council is doing in holding up them being able to live their dream is immoral, unfair. And um, I, I read through the minutes of the last meeting and there was one thing that really stood out, stood out to me. There was a lot of items that referred to the community plan. Item 5.1, being recognised as a best practice organisation, delivering effective services and collaborating regionally. Section 5.3, continue to deliver effective services and refined management process. Thank I you, believe sir. you have failed. Thank you, sir. Naomi, Naomi Walker. Naomi, if you'd like to come forward. Naomi, where's Naomi? Got Naomi Walker down here. Where's Naomi? Ah, thank you. Hi. Sorry, quite nervous. Um, I'm in the Aspire estate as well. Um, I signed for my block of land 15 months ago and I've still been waiting for the Gawler Council to release it. It's been hard waiting. I don't really understand why I've had to wait so long. I have been given some reasons, but they don't really seem to make much sense. I have already been given council approval to build my house. So you've given me permission to build my house, but you're not giving me the block of land to build on doesn't make much sense either. I'm a single mum and I'm doing this all by myself and it's gonna be really hard. But the price of my house has just gone up $42,000 and I can't afford that. So I'm either gonna move into a house that's not gonna have heating and cooling, it's not gonna have floor coverings, anything I can get rid of so I can still have my dream home or I'm gonna to have to downsize and get something a lot smaller and go back through the council approval process again, which I don't really want to. I'm sure you can see why. 
just want a resolution. I just want a home for my daughter to be near her school. Julian Midwinton, Edith Street. Julian. Thank you, Mayor Redmond, councillors. I'm here to talk uh, about uh, the disappointment that the Edith Street uh, residents had in the community consultation process. The residents were angry and confused by the decision to deliberately deny them um, the democratic rights that uh, they hold by implementing a one house, one vote ploy to limit our ability to have a say in what happens on our street. To my knowledge, this is the first time in the Gola history that this has been done in a community consultation. We, the rate paying residents of Gola were also then shocked and dumbfounded by the change of position by Jane Lovell from MFY at the community meeting that was held to discuss the problems on Edith Street. At that meeting, she stated the majority of cars using Edith Street entering from Murray Street were in fact Williston and Hewitt residents and were therefore legitimate users of Edith Street. And as it was their direct route to Lindock Road, they were not rat running as we were stating. She also stated that the lights at the main road had been tweaked and that it had brought about an instantaneous 25% reduction in the seven day average of cars using Edith Street. I tried to ask questions of Jane Lovell at the meeting, but I could not get the eye seconds. of the adjudicator. Thank you, Julian. I was then told when I rang MFY that I was not allowed to talk to them. I had been barred, they had been barred to talk to me by Gawler Council. I eventually got answers from Jane Lovell. And the answers were that there was actually no data and no statistics, no evidence whatsoever to back up her statement that the uh, cars using Edith Street were from Williston and Hewitt. It was just a supposition. She also could not answer the fact that residents from Hewitt have to weave through the back streets to get to Murray Street. And therefore it is not a direct route to Lindock Road from Hewitt. In fact, entering directly onto Adelaide Road. The main road is the direct route to Lindock Road from Hewitt. I have accessed data from the, from the June 21 survey so Julian, before the concrete debar debacle. If you, Julian, if you can wrap it up, thank you. Okay. It shows that two thirds to three quarters of the traffic using Edith Street enter from Lindock Road, not Murray Street, and that we are still experiencing that sort of traffic now, despite the tweaking of the, the traffic lights, and that no point in that data did it show five cars tailgating each other at 6.15 a.m., which we are now experiencing since the concrete debacle at High Street. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Mr. Ian Tully, boundary reform. Thank you, Mayor. I recently found your media statement that you released at the end of the 2018 elections where you said that the centrepiece of your first term was the Civic Centre and the centrepiece of your second term would be boundary reform. The Civic Centre and associated bills has been an incredible cost to council, apart from its massive blowout in the millions, the underperformance of the building and the promised outcomes from cafes, apps, and the hub have not been realized and 11 rooms significantly under, underperforming. But let's move on to boundary reform because we don't have much time. Boundary reform came in as a motion on notice. There was no workshops, there was no mandate, there was no costing, there was no risk analysis. We were just told we we're gonna go that way. Not one vote on the boundary reform has resulted in a unanimous vote. They barely got across the line with just a bare majority. Their officer's report tonight fails to tell us the existing cost of stage one and two, which is around about $100,000 wasted already. What it does tell us is that to proceed to stage three is gonna cost $416,000. And that money also will go down the toilet. I attended both the community consultations 
and the people from the affected areas, Hewitt, Gawler Belt, Barossa, Light, were scathing in their disgust at the boundary grab. What we have done is cost money. What we have done as we have got both of our neighbouring councils offside, and seconds, we have absolutely no prospect of getting this across the line. The survey done by Councillor Shanks and another councillor, where they surveyed 100 people, which is a significant um, consultation of the people of Hewitt, over 75% said they don't want to have a bar of it. And I think there was only 5% that said we'd like it, the others were indifferent. So councillors, tonight, if you vote for this, you're making a commitment to send about $500,000 down the gurgler, $500,000 of ratepayer money that could be spent on essentials, things like roads, like cleaning the main street, like curving. Don't waste the money on that folly tonight. We are watching, we will see, there's an election around the corner and I believe that even some of the councillors who in the past have supported that motion and it's never got, it's only just got across the line on the barest majority. Some of those are changing their mind tonight. It'll be very interesting, we'll be watching. Thank you. Mr. Shane Bailey, uh, resolutions and actions. Thank you. You're leaving a bit of work for the next council, are you? The way it looks tonight. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, 290 days ago, that's nearly 10 months, Town of Gawler received its report into the chronic failures of the Gawler Connected Community App. The report said what you've been told over and over again, that the app was a complete failure. The administration agreed with the recommendations the report's authors gave to shut down the app and suggested that you do the same, although they didn't agree with one of the recommendations. From the staff's report brought to that meeting 245 days ago, the main difference between council staff recommendations and the consultant's recommendations is the removal of consideration of a solution that assists small business to transition online, et cetera, et cetera. Council should step away from this type of activity. Council shouldn't have stepped in in the first place, but it chose to, and it chose to waste all that federal money and ratepayer money. Businesses had no say in the project, and after failing on literally every count of the app, it became, you're on your own. Council should step away. Councillors didn't agree with the staff recommendation, however. They agreed unanimously to leave in the recommendation from the consultant that states, consideration is given to an alternative arrangement which substantially delivers the objectives of assisting small business to transition online. Resolution 2021 12 COU 426 states in part, staff prepare a report to be brought back to a future meeting addressing that very point that the administration didn't want addressed. How many resolutions get passed in this chamber that never get acted on? Do you as councillors remember resolution 2021 10, 10 12 seconds, thank colon, you, thank you, COU 426? Where is the public register that details all the resolutions and at what stage they are at? You will get a report into an imaginary coronation quicker than you will have a report into helping businesses. Help that a report you paid nearly $10,000 for told you to give. When will we get a report requested last year, which could go some way to making up for the most wasteful episode of this council term, your term? During your term, $350,000 was turned into literally nothing. No asset, no IP, no benefits, not a cent of economic benefit outside that which the interstate-based developer and their subbies in Pakistan enjoyed, and clearly by virtue of the fact we have not even a whiff of a report as requested last year, no lessons learned. Thank you. Thank you. Sam Shetler. Sam Shetler. Where's Sam? Thank you. Skate Park. Hi there. Uh, this is in reference to the recommendation from the Infrastructure and Environmental Services uh, recommendation regarding the skate park. Um, just quickly, there's no recommendation regarding the hand soap that was put forward in the motion in April, which the, re the report, res uh, the recommendation results from. And I hope that, um, that hopefully there can be an interim solution uh, before um, uh, folks who work at the depot can invent a vandal proof soap dispenser because we could really use uh, some hand soap at the skate park. 
Um, one other thing on the recommendation from the IES is just uh, uh, the report that they produced, uh, there was no real uh, costs regarding the lights um, or the shade sales. And I thought perhaps uh, that would be really useful information to have to seek out grants uh, to make the skate park improvements uh, real in the future. Um, I have more to say, but I'll leave it there. Um, I'll just mention that um, uh, I talked to about six residents about sidewalks, one from Galler East, Williston and Evanston. Uh, and they all uh, were quite concerned that they don't have sidewalks on their streets. Um, and um, I'm told that's a, an issue that's been ongoing and uh, that council has plans to make about 2.5 kilometers of 30 sidewalks seconds, like you say. in the next few years, which is fantastic. Um, if I could just request um, if there's a policy that says the priority of which the sidewalks are built in the town, um, I would love to, to uh, read that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, Mr. Tony Piccolo, Aspire. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm here tonight to advocate on behalf of a group of potential landowners, home builders in the Aspire State at Evans South. <clears throat> I understand there's a dispute between the town of Gawler and Nancy Communities, the developer of the Aspire Estate. I'm not aware how the dispute has risen or the rights or wrongs of each party, but I'm very concerned about the impact the dispute is having on seven potential landowners who want to build the home in the estate. At the best of times, building a home can be quite stressful. While the dispute is between the town of Gawler and Lancelot communities, the landowners, home buyers have become collateral damage. The collateral damage has manifested itself in much higher building costs because building cannot commence with a title to the land. In one case, the delay in issuing titles has cost one landowner home builder $40,000 to date. The spiraling cost is hurting couples and families who just want to build an affordable home. The apparent impasse between the town of Gawler and Lance Communities has meant the titles for these eight allotments have not been issued despite all the immediate infrastructure required is in place. I further understand that Lance Communities has instituted legal proceedings to right what it believes is a wrong. I also understand the council has set aside $100,000 to defend the legal action. I say I understand because all these actions and decisions by the council have occurred behind closed doors. I'm advised that council should not, should council not succeed in its defence of the legal action, ratepayers could end up with a $400,000 damages and legal cost bill. These seven landowners home builders- 30 seconds, thank you, Tony. Thank you. Are not only incurring additional spiralling building costs, but I'm also have to foot the damages bill on properties they seek to purchase and build their homes upon. This dispute is hurting ordinary people who just want to build a home for themselves and their families. It shouldn't be that hard. Council must act immediately to find another way to resolve the impasse without further delays in ensuring these titles. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, can somebody go and turn that um, microphone off, please? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kath. Um, so a question to staff. I was just wondering if anyone had an update on this Aspire um, situation. I might uh, take that. The CEO can answer that. Um, well, as has been mentioned, we are in the courts with Aspire pertaining to the uh, the child care centre proposal, which is on reserve land. Uh, there is a relationship between that matter and these allotments and um, uh, some other complications. Um, uh, and uh, we've been seeking to resolve the matter um, without further legal proceedings. Um, we are acting in the best interest of the broader Gawler community. Um, we have presented a report to council, as has been mentioned. Um, uh, as a consequence of these deputations, I'll, I'll seek to uh, seek further clarity in terms of where the matter is at uh, and, and then report back to Council. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Vallelonga. Henry, I just want to put my $2 worth in. You got a question? Uh, yes, I have. Good. And it's a pretty serious one. Why can't the people who 
have bought the blocks of land, settle, and the money go in trust, and while cancel, then argue it out with what's known, because it's going to happen anyway. They're going to they're going to move on, and you're going to be um, in court for we don't know. But if you can pass the uh, pass uh, the blocks through, so they can get a title, they can build their houses. The money is in trust, and I'm and I'm sure that the land developer would agree with that. Uh, CEO, would that be uh, possible? CEO, I'll ask you to respond to that. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm mindful that uh, there are you know um, discussions happening on multiple fronts with lawyers involved, and again, we're trying to avoid any further legal proceedings. Um, we have been and sought to have reasonable outcomes with developers um, in being equally respectful of the residents, but also being mindful of council's commitment in terms of um, you know, the broader infrastructure obligations that are at play. So um, I, I think it's probably best that I leave it at that because there are sort of legal matters at play here. Councillor Shanks. Councillor Shanks. Yeah. Um, just through you, Chair. So given the deputations tonight, you made a comment and you said um, you might want to go back and seek some further advice. Can we have a bit of a timeline on that? I mean, these are people's lives we're playing with here. So um, are we able just to, I guess, expedite that, speed it up a little bit, maybe come back to us next week? What's the time frame around it, do you think? See ya. Uh, well, um, as members are aware and has been referenced, there has been a detailed report to council, a confidential report to council that, that, that provided a, a thorough assessment of where we're at. Um, I'm mindful and, and conscious about the impacts that this is having uh, on, on families. Uh, I'm more than happy and, and will continue to see if we can expedite a solution. And I'm more than happy for us to uh, bring back a further report to council, whether that's at the next ordinary council meeting or by way of a special meeting. Councillor Little. Councillor Little. A question for the CEO, I think. What I'm believed to is the the Spy Group have actually lodged four hundred fifty thousand, five hundred fifty thousand dollars of bond on that land. Now, to me, the dispute should be over the amount of the bond they put on that land, not on the actual residents who are trying to build the house. To me, it's and to me. So to what's me, your question, Councillor Little? The question is why are we being bloody minded to these other these seven people around blocks when it's a dispute with the SPI group? It means if they've lodged money, why can't the CEO say, well, we'll have a go at you because you haven't lodged enough money, but why pick on the, the rate base? Um, CEO, do you want to respond to that? Can you provide a response? Thank you. The council, when it was processing the land division application um, and was in negotiation with the developer at that point, um, acted in good faith when individual prospective landowners wanted to lodge applications for dwellings. At that point, we, we were working with the developers and we were working towards a solution and we did accept those dwelling applications. Um, and in good faith, we processed those applications um, because that's what the, the, the individual prospective purchasers were wanting and that's what the builders were wanting. And in good faith, we did that because we had a um, clear understanding that there was a possible resolution to the concerns that we now have. Now, that didn't pan out um, and it was always clear in council's position in dealing with the developers uh, that we wouldn't be lodging the titles until we uh, had resolution. Um, now that's where we were at 12 months ago or, or, or further, further back from then. Um, that's probably, I think, as far as I should make public comments because I'm mindful that the matter was reported to council in a confidential report. But I can say that I will be following up as a matter of urgency. I'll seek whether or not where there is any further progress that we can make expeditiously and then report back to council as quickly as we can. Thank you. Any other questions? And then we might move on to deputations. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, just in regards to uh, Mr. Bailey's presentation, we talked about that motion that's been, I think you quoted, two hundred and forty-five days. What was the 
plan around when we might see that start coming back. Thank you. Mr. Bauer. Through the Chair, the intention is to present a report to the September Council meeting. We've been dealing with uh, another matter regarding the app, as Council is aware, uh, through confidential reports over the last few months, which we've now come to a resolution of, and we'll be reporting that through to Council in September. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, everyone uh, for uh, speaking to Council and thank you for the questions. So we'll move on to deputations, Mr Ian Torley, Climate Emergency Action Plan. And Ian, you have five minutes and I'll give you a 30 second warning, okay? Is that on me? Yep, yeah. okay, thank you. CO2 sat at 260 parts per million for millennia until it began to rise exponentially with the industrial revolution and the burning of fossil fuels in the late 1800s and really taking off after World War II. Warnings aren't recent. They've been ringing out loudly since the early 1900s. CO2 is now at 421 parts per million in the atmosphere and has increased by 14 parts per million in just the past four years that it's taken to develop the CAP. 109.2 gigatons of CO2 has been added in just the last four years. There's enough CO2 in the system to take us well past two degrees Celsius of warming. And we are already living with the cost and consequences of 1.2 degrees of warming. Heat waves, drought, wildfires, ocean rise, glacial and ice melt, food insecurity, climate refugees, species loss, disease vectors and pandemics and plagues. You see, global warming and climate change is science is physics and science and physics are no respecters of deniers, denial, nor of conspiracy theorists. While real and significant action on climate change should have happened decades ago and has been thwarted and held back by lies, deception, misinformation and game playing by vested interests, by coal and oil lobbyists and politicians, the dire consequences of the unstoppable reality of science and physics have played out before our eyes. What we've seen play out here in Gawler Council in many ways mirrors what has happened out globally. There has been hesitancy, there has been denial, there has been misinformation, there has been game playing, there has been delaying tactics, scaremongering and not taking the threat seriously, etc. even here at Gawler Council. We've seen councillors on this council vote against the climate emergency declaration. The mayor used their position on Garrick and the LGA executive to block and vote against my first two attempts to have the LGA make a climate emergency declaration. The CEO cut the initial SEAT funding to only $5,000 and I had to fight to get it back to a paltry $20,000. Councillor Koch, who voted against this climate emergency declaration, cynically was voted onto the SEAT working group. Games were played and delaying tactics played out on the SEAT as I predicted they would. Two CAP working group members were sacked and then reinstated. And now a certain council on the CAP working group wants the CAP to go to the Audit and Risk Committee as a further delaying tactic. Going to the Audit and Risk Committee is unnecessary and just an attempt to block. The Biodiversity Management Plan that cost over $90,000 and that has over $3 million in recommendations was never sent to the Audit and Risk the boundary reform with its innate risk was never sent to the audit and risk to be checked out. And neither were many other or any other plans. And I think of the community plan and the $250,000 grabbed at short notice for contributory items. With so much CO2 already in the atmosphere, with the catastrophic impacts of 1.2 degrees of warming playing out for our eyes, with population growth of 7.58 billion, with deforestation happening at the rate of the size of Adelaide Oval every 1.4 seconds globally. You can see why many believe that we have passed the point of no return. However, COVID taught us that with the will and with enough money and with positive action by politicians and policymakers, we can achieve incredible outcomes in a very short time. We saw that with the development of vaccines in under 12 months because we threw enough money at it. If every country had a climate election like Australia has just had, if every council committed to prioritising and enacting a CAP like the one before you, then there is hope. 
I'd like to congratulate Catherine Warhurst and most of the members of ASEA for the dedicated work and hard work they put in for 12 months. Stunning. I commend the SEAT to you, and I hope that members will unanimously support Thank you, Mr. Councillor Chairman. Shank's motion tonight. We'll watch the debate eagerly. I know that at least one of these members, if not two, will vote to delay. They will argue that it is sensible and reasonable to send it to the audit and risk, because then it'll be delayed, then it'll be a new council, and then it just may be forgotten. Have none of it. The work has been done by this, in this term, by this group, and it deserves to be dealt with. Councillor Shank's motion is a smart move to gazunk the Thank people you. who are trying to undermine it. Thank you. And I implore you, you to Mr. vote Tully. in favour of his motion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. That concludes deputations. Are there any declarations of interest tonight, councillors? on any matter coming up on our agenda? Be none? Okay. We now move to, there's no adjourned items, there's no petitions, confirmation of minutes. We have two, I'll do them one at a time. Ordinary council meeting, 26th of July, 2022. You happy to move that way, Councillor Fraser? Thank you. A seconder is uh, Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Hughes. There's no further discussion. I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Carriage unanimously. Moving on to special council meeting on the 4th of August 2022. You're happy to move that way, Councillor Goldstone, seconded by Councillor Vallalonga. If there's no further discussion, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands. It is carried unanimously. There is no business arising from minutes that I can see. Um, now, I know that there's a, an idea that we move the seat motion forward. I would like to deal with boundary reform first, and then I'll accept your, if you're happy to move that way, um, uh, Councillor Shanks. Uh, okay. So we'll move on to 10.1. Councillor Davies, are you happy to move that way? Are you happy to speak? Thanks, Mayor. I would like to move this motion. Look, I haven't been entirely happy with the bureaucratic process that we've had to go through for boundary reform. And I do wish that some aspects could be a little clearer, but what I do believe is that it's vital for the Gola Council to get this done. I don't think we have the option to sit around doing nothing about this, because unfortunately, the Gola Council has had to adapt to a range of circumstances that have been beyond its control. It was not the Council who decided to approve a plan for 10,000 new houses in Concordia at the border of Gola East. That's an estimated population of around 24,000 in a suburb that currently houses only around 150 people. As a town, we only have a population of 25,000 ourselves, you know. Hewitt is another suburb that's been part of our boundary reform discussion for similar reasons, and I think we've heard a lot of back and forth on that one. But to be clear on the scale here, the last census only put it at a population of around 3,000. With Concordia, we're talking about eight times the scale of Hewitt. We need to be there on the ground floor of these developments. Where will this new population the size of Gola go? Will they use our roads and our services and become strongly linked with our town? Or will they spend their time a half hour drive away at the Barossa Council facilities in Newry? I think we all know the answer to that one. I would go so far as to call this an oversight from the state government who have failed to review South Australia's council boundaries for the past 25 years leaving us to attempt to pick up both the slack and the bill. This development is going to have a huge impact on the future of our town. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that what we do over the next decade to prepare for rapid nearby growth will determine whether or not Gola will retain its cultural identity over the next 50 years, or just fade away to become part of the suburbs, a quaint little part of the city of Playford where the houses are older than most. If we could integrate that new suburb into Gola's culture, 
and build up the local area into a united place that retains our history and cultural identity, how much would that be worth to our town? If suburbs like Concordia could be designed consistently with its nearby suburbs, instead of the area having a haphazard mix of council rules, what would the total savings to ratepayers look like in the long term? Forget six figures, I think we could be looking at nine. We're not asking for something wild here. The way that I've heard it from some people, you'd think that we were an army marching into new territories, bent on conquest. But all we're asking is that council boundaries act accurately portray the reality of the situation that we are already dealing with. If we put our hands over our eyes and pretend nothing is happening, our reality still isn't going to change. We're not requesting for there to be something new. We already have suburbs like Hewitt built to rely on Gawler Council infrastructure and suburbs like Concordia on the way to continue to do more of the same. All we ask is for the realities of Gawler's situation to be reflected by our actual boundaries so that we have what we need to keep this town working. We're simply asking for our Gawler community to be allowed to survive by being allowed to plan not just for the present, but for the decades ahead. Please support this motion. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Hughes, do you wish to second? Do you wish to speak? Yeah. Um, yes, I do wish to uh, second. And yeah, no, uh, well, well said, uh, Councillor Davies, very, very well said. Um, uh, I think it's very important for the future of Gawler that um, this process goes through. Um, boundary form's not new. It's, it's something that councils have worked with for many years. You know, Gawler itself was just divided with Gawler South, uh, Williston, Central Gawler. Um, then in the 80s, we, we picked up Evanston Gardens. Um, we continued to grow. And unfortunately, um, we may have missed the boat with um, you know, the Hewitt development. And um, you know, there was a lot of poli politics going on at that time. And um, you know, unfortunately, Gawler um, did not um, become part of Hewitt. Hewitt is a suburb uh, of Gawler, uh, but it's um, controlled by uh, the council based in Kapunda, which is a long way away. And um, yeah, unfortunately, they, they use a lot of our services, our swimming pool, our dog park, and um, a, a lot of a lot of a lot of services in Gawler. Um, I think it's it's very important that we get on the front foot with Concordia. Um, you know, it, it, we're, we're talking uh, a future development of ten thousand allotments, estimates of twenty two thousand to twenty four thousand people, um, and you know, something that's going to happen through for the next twenty years or so. So I, I think I'm satisfied with the legal protections that we've now been been offered, so I'm happy to support the motion in, in that regard. Um, I think strategically it is really important to, to address our boundaries. It's, it's something that has been raised with me by um, a lot of ratepayers over my term as a councillor. It's something that confuses them and it confuses the residents of Hewitt when they ask me how come they're not part of Gawler. Um, yeah, I, I do think that this process is the um, way to go. Um, and we've already invested a, a lot of time and money in the process. And I'd like to continue that uh, uh, to get an integrated Greater Gawler uh, for the benefit of all um, and integrated into our town, which is so important. Thanks. Discussion, uh, Councillor Fraser and then Councillor Vallelonga. Um, yes, um, I agree with um, Councillor Davies, well said, and um, Deputy Mayor Hughes. Um, this is something we have to do. If you know, it might cost us four hundred thousand now. Not not the figures that we were told that they're an exaggeration. Um, but if we don't do it now, it's going to cost us three times that in the future. And you know, they talk about Concordia being twenty years away, but you know, Springwood was started fifteen to twenty years away ago. So that time is not is not that far away for Concordia to be developing at all. Um, and as far as public consultation goes, when we go out, we listen to the people of Hewitt, but we're here to represent the people of Gawler, not Hewitt. So they're the numbers that we have to listen to, is what the people of Gawler want, not what other people want. So um, I fully support this because if we don't, 
we need to have a say on this new suburb, Concordia. It's, it's going to be on our doorstep. It's going to affect us, whether you want it to or not, it will. Um, and we need to be on the ground floor to have a say. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Balawonga, you're next. I don't have a problem with boundary reform, with boundary reform, but uh, why do we have to spend all this money? And are we are we guaranteed once we've spent that money that we're going to get it? And how is it? How is it? Who gives it? Who gives us the okay to have boundary reform? Uh, is it a government is issue? The legislation gives us the okay to progress boundary reform. However, the commission, the boundaries commission, uh, does the investigations. But why do we have to spend the money? Because that's that's how it's set and up. And where, where's it spent, Mayor? I beg your pardon. Where's it spent? Uh, they've provided uh, a number of reasons where that money will go, and a lot of that will be community engagement and other investigations. So they'll do quite a thorough investigation. That's my understanding. Yeah. Uh, uh, Councillor Goldstone. Um, yeah, look, I, I've supported boundary reform since the matter was first brought to council. Um, as the deputy mayor said, it's not new. Uh, boundary reform discussions have been going on. I can remember back in the late 80s, early 90s, when both myself and Councillor Little was on council, discussions on boundary reform were, were occurring then. Um, I can't see any logical argument as to why Hewitt and more specifically Concordia specifically should not formally be part of Gawler. We need to think long term and consider what's best for Gawler um, over the next 20, 10, 20, 30, 40 plus years. Um, we're not talking about the next two or three years, so we need to think long term. The population will be far greater. Um, there's going to be greater pressure on service delivery and infrastructure. Um, the people in those areas also should have input into the community in which they're living in, which they don't at the moment. So um, I will be supporting this motion. Um, and I, I would refer members back to the first paragraph on page 10 of the, of the report, which in my view summarises the issue quite nicely. Any other discussion? at this stage, um, Councillor Shanks and then Councillor Little. Uh, thank you, members. Um, and, and look, Cody, that was well said. Well, I definitely um, commend you for that. Um, first, I'll start by saying I'm not against um, the idea of the discussion taking place. I'm against the way that we've chosen to embark on the discussion to date. Um, we, we heard um, an overwhelming response of uh, Gawler residents that we need to listen to. Just to be clear, that was around 60 people. We spent a lot of money um, on all that um, consultation. We held open forums. We held everything. We had, I think, around, what was it, 120? You know, I'm rounding up or rounding down here, but bear with me. And I think, what did we have? Around 60% of respondents said no way. But then we chose, well, hang on a minute, they're not Gawler residents, so let's have a look at this. I don't think the messaging is right. I don't think it stops at Concordia. I don't think it stops at Hewitt. If we are worried about towns, developments, everything that is going to happen regardless, then we need to take over Roseworthy. We need to move into Tanunda. Why stop here? Let's keep on going. You see the logic, you see how flawed that is. Our businesses benefit from the population growth that is happening in the North right now. Nothing we do in boundary reform um, chasing changes that. But the point that I want to make, because I've made all these points before, is $130,000 is being tacked on to what you all agreed would go into the budget for this, for sure. $130,000. That brings your price tag up to $400,000 that you're tasking the next chamber with on this brochure that we don't have a strong remit for. I agree the conversation should be happening. I was talking with Bim Lange today, who is trying to organize a meeting with our CEO, our mayor, and the developers of Concordia to see how they can work with Gawler about the issues that may occur 
in 2041, 2051, as we were talked about today. Population growth and services used is, an ex is a reason that I think we should unpack, but to date we have not. The community um, vote, I completely agree with Kelvin. That is the argument that I believe has the most merit and why I have been, I supported the motion in the first place to actually start the conversation. Ever since then, we've only closed our ears and tried to get the wrong, and I believe put the wrong messaging out there. Unpack services, unpack local government roads, unpack government roads, Tell me what services these plagues of locusts that are coming in and eating up and then disappearing and not contributing. I go to the Barossa every weekend with my family and play on their playgrounds. Do I need to now pay rates at Barossa? It makes no sense. And if we can get some figures, I'm a logical thinker. If you can give me the figures and the facts and data, you have my full support, but you're nowhere near that. And you're preaching that the commission is gonna do all that work for us people that have no connection with our community, people that will look at lines on a map and turn around and say, thanks for your 400 grand, it's up to the minister to agree, you know what, your neighbours don't want it, so therefore we don't actually see the viability of this. And where does your boundary stop then if you're taking this? Because you'll go to Roseworthy, you'll go. We haven't unpacked this to the level we should, and we know full well we've spent way more than $11,000 on stage one and stage two internally and staff over the last however, however many years. But this nearly half a million commitment for the next chamber to have to deal with is unfair to put them $130,000 behind the eight ball before they're even starting on something that can be decided next year. If you're that confident about it, let the next chamber decide. Councillor Little. Yeah, I, I'm in the same, I voted for boundary reform in the first instance. And as uh, Councillor Goldstone said, I was from the council back in 97 when we discussed Hewitt at the time. Every councillor in this chamber voted against Hewitt going there. There was money spent then. What happened? The government said, no, nah, it's going there. My problem is I don't want to impose this amount of money on the new council, who whatever that may be. Some of us might be here, some might not be. My big beef is it's a lot of money. Let's defer it until a new council comes in. It's not going to hold up the government because they take bloody ages to do anything anyway. Pardon my French. So my problem is I do not want to impose this amount of debt to start the new council off. So I will be voting against the motion on that thing. I'm for boundary reform, but I'm not. I do not want to impose the money on the new council. Thank you. Any other discussion? If not, Councillor Davies, you can close the debate. Thank you. Yeah, look, um, thanks to everyone for the important debate. Um, this is a big investment and, you know, we need to take a deep look at it before we make decisions. And look, I definitely understand where Councillor Shanks is coming from. I've had a range of discussions with him about this over the years um, and I share some of his concerns, but fundamentally where I come down on boundary reform is that the broader picture of defining our Gola community is one of the most important topics that we could be prioritizing as a council. And look, there's, to answer some questions, I guess, in terms of where the boundaries stop, I don't think it's, I don't think it's as dramatic as presented. We're not gonna lay a claim on Alice Springs. Like it's, you know, there's, there's some surrounding suburbs directly on our borders and then there's, you know, a 30 minute drive and then there's some country towns. And we're trying to deal with, with that, you know, I don't think we're gonna decide to become the Brisbane City Council and say, we're gonna look after 8 million people. Um, and in terms of the next council, look, this is, I mean, well, like has been said about the climate emergency plan, this is our council's work. This is what we've been working on over the past four years. Um, and, you know, this, I think this is something that is really valuable for us, as the council who have been working on it over the past four years to pass. And yes, there's some more work to be done in figuring out some of the fine details, um, especially when it comes to already established suburbs like Hewitt. We are trying to get in ahead on the Concordia development precisely because when you get a situation like Hewitt where everyone's already set up, then it gets tricky. But look, we're not doing something unprecedented with that either. You know, it has been a little while since the SA Council boundaries last changed, but it was in, 
I think 1997, I think was the last time a bunch of councils amalgamated and that kind of thing. But, you know, this is simply the kind of thing that happens when council boundaries are responsibly reviewed to make sure they are still ad adhere to being up to date communities of interest. Like if we break this down into the basics, like what is a council? What makes us a council area? Like that's tough for some of the rural councils because the government just has to mash together five different unrelated towns and call them a council. But for Gola, we do have a clear reason to be a distinct legal entity from Playford or Liberossa. This area used to be a mishmash of four or five different council areas until the people of Gola came together one day to say, hey, we would like to be treated as one community. And now we're back to having an issue where current and future parts of our community are outside of our borders on a technicality because this is a quickly growing area of South Australia and the last time the government looked at boundaries was in the 90s. So look, let's ask the important future thinking questions. In 20 years, when the, the completed houses in Concordia start rolling in, will they have been built to cohere to a greater Gola whole? Or will they just be 10,000 houses built as an, a Barossa outpost? That's gonna decide whether Gola continues to be relevant as a town into the future. So that's why I support this motion and I hope everyone votes for it. The debate is closed. I'm gonna put that motion, all those in favor, please raise your hands. All those against, it is carried, thank you. Councillor Vallalonga has called a division. All those in favour, please stand and stay standing. Thank you. Uh, all those in favour are Councillor Davies, Councillor Kosh, Councillor Goldstone, Deputy Mayor Hughes, Councillor Fraser. All those against are Councillor Vallalonga, Councillor Little and Councillor Shanks. The motion is carried. Thank you very much. Now, um, we do have... We do have um, somebody from Gaula South here waiting to speak. Are you comfortable in allowing that to go forward? Because I think it is appropriate. Now, John Giannito, if you'd like to come forward to the microphone and uh, you've, got a you you've got the opportunity to say a few words to the council. Uh, thank you, Mayor Redmond. And when you say a few words, do I have a time limit? Uh, you've got five minutes. <clears throat> I'll try to make it quick. Uh, thank you all. Uh, John Giannetto is my name. I'm a committee member at South Gawler Football Club. I'm also a coach there. I'm also a father of five kids who enjoy the facilities there from netball to football, both men and women. Uh, an apology sent from Dan, uh, Daniel Kirik, our president, Cosi Costa, secretary. We've done a lot of work on this lights issue that you have before you. And I must admit, I've come in quite late as it's come up to the committee with the, the recent challenge we had. So I'll do my best to answer the questions that you have. Um, I noticed tonight you have a recommendation ahead of you, which basically council supports us uh, installing new lights and we're going to contribute $4,000 to a safe removal of the existing ones. I think it's important to understand that the existing lights are being brought to our attention that they are unsafe. Um, there are uh, engineers reports that they say they can't be used. So simply just spending $4,000 to remove them removes the risk that we now know have no lights to use for this community facility that is clearly there uh, for football in particular that needs lights, um, particularly during the winter, the winter months. Um, there's also discussion about the, a lease where we're, we are required to pay and maintain for many things. I'd just like to uh, highlight that um, in negotiating and signing this lease, an, an exact scenario was uh, tabled about capital cost sharing in the future. And it was, uh, we were assured that we won't be carrying the can on some of the capital items required at South Gawler. $4,000 towards these lights seems a, a bit um, in balance when you look at what we've proposed, what it's going to cost to change. Um, and I'm going to speed up to that because um, on, page 20, oh, on page 19, there is a breakdown of what we believe the financial implications will be. Um, some, a quota price is about $54,000. And you'll see under that, South Gaul are fortunate to have, uh, have sponsors and players who are, dare I say, concreters, heavy machinery, and a lot of the services required in putting these uh, lights up. And if we were to use them, uh, we'd probably need to offer them some contra sponsorship arrangements, which is an ongoing cost to the club moving forward. But we believe a revised total of more like $30,899 is more achievable and would be asking a recommendation if council could uh, split that 60% and 40% South Gawler, and I'll go into that why. 
$18,500 for council and um, $12,300 for south. Um, we are a non-profit organisation, as you, you understand, volunteers providing community um, safe place uh, to go and uh, have sport and recreation. We also put money back into the Gawler community by using hotels, bakeries, dry cleaners, sports stores, etc. cetera. Um, this issue in some of the letters I saw was that uh, the damage has probably happened over because a car has um, probably hit the poles over, over the time. It's important to note that South Gawler is pretty much open 24 hours a day. The, the facility, not the club rooms, but the oval expanse. There's much thoroughfare from the residents in Gawler West to the bus stop and to the school and to the train station. We really only have control of it on a Saturday or every second Saturday during football season between like eight in the morning and 3 p.m. where we charge people to come in and we welcome them to come. Outside of those hours, it's anyone can do anything, um, which is shown many times when we arrive and there's all sorts of um, things around and on the overall. I won't go into um, what people walk dogs and what they do and, and smash bottles around, et cetera, and we're left to tidy all that up. So it is an open area. I do see that there's a reference to the other sporting clubs and what they've received. They don't have the public thoroughfare that we have. They don't have the after hours access as such that we have. We can't lock our gates. It is a facility for all. And also I think with the Central Williston um, uh, lighting, and I'm not that close to them, but I think they chose to change their lights. We are having a cost impost on us that we are required to remove these poles, which then mitigates the risk of these potentially falling over. However, that does nothing about actually giving us light, which is what we're paying a lease for, to use that oval, which is, has lights. In addition, um, our facilities, um, and I hope not many of you have been there recently, but they are outdated, quite embarrassing, and amongst the Barossa League are definitely the worst in the league. South and, Cent and Willison are the only two ovals that don't have two ovals. That is important with junior football. If you live in Anguston, you need to come to Gawler South on Friday night in the wet cold, go back to Anguston, and then come back Saturday morning if you have other children, netballers, or you're playing in the other grades. So if you have two ovals, football happens on a Saturday. We cannot have two ovals at South. We have outgrown our facilities and council are well aware that we are looking for another facility. So we're not looking to spend more money of community, basically sporting club, not-for-profit money on a facility capital improvements that we're hoping to leave in the next three to five years. As I said, so looking at that cost proposal, I'd like to recommend that um, with the help and support of sponsors, players, and also some committee members who have access to concreting and heavy machinery, et cetera, that the revised total is more like $30, $31,000 and the 60 to 40% split between council and South Gawler making an $18,500 contribution by council is based on the fact that in years to come, hopefully when South have a new oval and a new facility, that the community of Gawler will be able to um, use those lights on that uh, community space that'll be theirs forever. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, councillors, we have a report. I'll take it as read. Uh, we have an officer's recommendation. Uh, Councillor Shanks, you've got your hand up. I saw you first. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move a version of this if I could. So, point two, where it says $4,000, I'd like to change that to 18 and a half. And you'd like to speak to that? I will, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, councillors, it is well documented um, what the Gola South facility is like in the league. Um, Ms. Gina has pointed it out again tonight. It's getting to the point where it's actually getting a little bit embarrassing um, for this club that is a very strong club, very successful club, um, not being able to hold their finals, uh, having to host it at a, at a um, rival club etc cetera, etc cetera. we've had these conversations more recently um, with this club with some of the items that they were having to mitigate and, and work through and we did show them the support that they needed um, at that time 
I'll also remind members that um, we have assisted other sporting clubs. I believe in our first year, um, we decided to give a $20,000 sponsorship to the Gaula Central's Netball Club, if I remember correctly, to help with some resurfacing. Um, that was some in-kind um, stuff that we actually changed over to a, to a cash contribution to allow them to carry out the works because as what uh, Mr. Gino has pointed out, these clubs are made up of community-minded people and a lot of them being tradies is actually very handy um, for these clubs. Now, this um, sort of infrastructure work, um, I'm glad that the, the South Gawler um, Footy Club have done their own costings and using their own um, connections because what we're going to get out of this um, contribution, which I will remind members is about 14,500 more than what we were planning on doing just what well, was recommended to do before. But what we get is um, a brand new uh, light and, a, and an action on a, on a serious risk, as we know. Um, and also, as pointed out, we have to find a spot for Gaul South at some point in time, investing big bucks from the sporting community now in land that we are to take back over and figure out what to do it doesn't seem like the smart play. I think we should be supporting our sporting clubs and this $14,000 is a, is a mere drop in the ocean in comparison to what we've just waved through on the previous motion. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Ballalonga, do you wish to speak? No. Discussion? Uh, I saw Deputy Mayor and then Councillor Little. Um, yeah, I, I, I sort of support um, maybe $8,000, but not um, for not uh, eighteen and a half thousand, so at eighteen and a half, I'll, I'll be voting against it. Um, and the reason I came up with eight thousand dollars is because the other clubs we do have in the past given interest interest free loans, and um, that interest free is worked out on thirty thousand dollars, is worked out on about seven and a half thousand dollars as an interest cost that they saved. Um, and I think that's fair to the other clubs um, if we. Um, do provide eighteen and a half thousand dollars. I think we'll be hit up by the other clubs. Um, we do have nearly two hundred community clubs in Gawler, um, and we've been very careful not to make um, special contributions. Um, I'm always been in favour of the interest-free loans. I think that's an excellent uh, process that council uh, does to, to help the clubs. Um, and so, yeah, in this case. Um, I'd see a contribution, say $8,000 as, as being what the interest costs would probably cost uh, or the savings for, for the club over that time if we were to provide interest-free loan. But um, I think $18,500 is, is, is not reasonable uh, considering we've got so many other clubs uh, to support. Um, the only users of these lights is the football club. Um, it's um, not anyone else in the community that would be benefiting from these lights. And um, the fact that the, the grounds and everything else, um, I mean, the oval itself, which council looks after is in excellent condition, but um, the club rooms and, and things like that are actually, um, the, the club itself um, you know, has you know, not been investing money in those club rooms. So they're not really very good at all. Um, so yeah, I'll be voting against this motion. Councillor Little, you're next and then Councillor Fraser. Yeah, I, I, I think we should support it for a couple of reasons. If this power pole was on uh, outside the grounds, it'd be an SA power network, so we'd have to fix it. The problem we got with South Gawler, which is not the same as Central or Williston, they can lock their grounds. We have the public going through there. I've been down there some days, a mess on that road, like on the road from needles and other stuff, dog poo, that people use that thoroughfare all the time. My problem is if somebody hurts themselves by this pole, Who's liable? We, as a council, have allowed the public to use it as the public thoroughfare. So to me, it is our domain. I know the count all the South use those lights, but it is a different situation than the other two clubs because it is a public thoroughfare where the other two ovals aren't. So I don't think it's out of order for us to repair something that basically is our responsibility as well as theirs. Thank you. Councillor Fraser. Um, I have two minds of this. I understand um, Gawler South's um, position over there. I understand that their grounds aren't very big. I also understand that the condition of their, um, 
their, their club rooms aren't that great. But I can't have favouritism between the clubs. Gawler Central put lights in and they cost, they, they took out a, a, I thought it was a $30,000 loan, but it might have been 20, so I won't argue over that. Um, Williston, their lights cost 30,000. And as far as I know, they got a grant, plus they put the rest of the money in themselves. So um, I, would, I would agree with the Deputy Mayor to go to 8,000 and maybe a $10,000 interest-free loan. But I don't know that I can um, agree to 18,000 when the other clubs had to pay for the lights themselves. Um. Councillor uh, Goldstone and then Councillor Koch. Uh, just a question. Uh, I note in the report it says that the fund, the $4,000 was coming from the property and facilities management budget. Um, is there enough in that budget to accommodate the additional 14000 or if not, where would it be coming from? Mr Horwood? Uh, through the Chair, uh, I wouldn't be in the position here and now, Mayor, to say whether there'd be uh, capacity within that uh, budget line itself. But if uh, council was to consider the additional uh, 14,500, we'd obviously have to incorporate it in the first quarterly, quarterly budget review and in terms of uh, identifying where it was to be funded from me. Thank you. Uh, uh, council Kosh. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, look, I understand the, the issues down there, uh, but unfortunately I can't support this. We would be um, providing, providing favouritism to one club over another club. You know, I've been here long enough to see what uh, Gawler Centrals did with the lights and the doghouse, how we provided um, interest-free loans and they, they got on and did it and they're paying us back. Same as Williston. I'm not too sure about the Williston one, but I think, I think they, just, they just got on and did it themselves. So that's pretty good. Um, I'm quite happy with the $4,000 because potentially, yes, it was hit by a car. We don't know when. It's unsafe. It should be removed. I went and had a look at it. Yes, there's a big, big you know, it bent, so it must be moved. I'm a bit concerned when we say that no other areas don't, aren't public. I think up at Williston, people do actually walk through there. I know from the BMS Club, they do people walk through there. And I'm not sure whether Central's is locked it every night. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But th th those places are public places anyway. Um, we're going to put a new playground at um, all the centrals at, at, on Princess Park. And so that, that will be open to the public a majority of the time. So to say that South is the only public area, I think is, isn't actually quite correct. Um, so it's interesting that South is saying they want to move. I'm not sure where they'll move to and the cost there. Um, so, you know, you're spending a lot of lot on the lights and then you're not, they're not going to be used. You may even not even use that facility later on once South leaves. So really it's it's something that South really wants to do. They need it. All the other clubs have got on and put their own lights up. So for me, I'm not happy to support this. I'd be happy with the, I, originally I was happy with the four. If it goes to the eight, I would support that, but I wouldn't be supporting the 18-5. Thank you. Any other discussion? If not, Councillor Shanks, you can close the debate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, members. Um, yeah, good debate. Um, look, I just want to point out a few things. Um, the clubs that have pulled together and worked out how to replace their lights um, planned for that to happen. And they have been positioning themselves to do that for X amount of years. Gawler South um, have a different circumstance that they're working towards. Um, and, and it was discussed tonight. This is something that is an impost on them due to aging infrastructure that has not been touched by this council for X amount of years. I think the report says these things are about 30 odd years old. I am starting to get a vibe and an understanding on why our Gawler clubs that are so strong don't have the facilities that the Barossa clubs do. I'm starting to understand that now. Um, we didn't ask where the $130,000 is coming from boundary reform. Yet we want to find out where the $14,500 is coming from to fix infrastructure that we own. Fundamentals, fundamental service levels, supporting community clubs, $14,500 we're going to sit here and squabble over a safety concern on a community-run sporting club 
that is successful in bringing in the community that we want here in the town of Gawler. A community club that only supports our local businesses. I, I, I'm flabbergasted that this is even a discussion and that we're going to turn around and go, you know what, I can't support this, but let's barter. Let's talk about $8,000 and save ourselves $6,000. What are you going to put that $6,000 to? Support the clubs that support this town. And if you want to open the flood, if you don't want to open the flood gates to other clubs and show them support, then I would say that's the wrong view to have. And I also really, really want to remind elected members, we've allowed $20,000 contribution towards resurfacing the netball courts at the Gawler Central's club, a sporting club. That wasn't the loan that we're talking about for the lights. That was a different thing. We are supporting clubs. We have been in the past. This isn't the prerequisite that we are going to open the floodgates. That's already set. And it's a good prerequisite to set to show we support our community clubs that support our town. So I hope we can get some support. I hope we can move forward. And we're not gonna be in the papers tomorrow about that, about that council that squabbled over $6,000 while waving through another 130. Uh, the debate's closed. Uh, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands. All those against, it is carried. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, now um, you wanted to move a motion to move an item forward, Councillor Shanks. So you want to move um, uh, 16.4. So uh, you're moving that 16.4 be brought forward. Do I have a seconder for that? Uh, Councillor Goldstone is the seconder. I'll just allow the minute taker to catch up. Uh, and I'll put that motion that 16.4 will be brought forward. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, so, um, Councillor Shanks, you can pre present your motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, look, I think a lot of the points um, have been raised tonight by our engaged community that have taken the time out of their um, agenda to come and, and present to this chamber. I think the main points that we really need to make clear here is this motion is merely just to complete the work that we will support. This work and this plan by endorsing does not commit us to any spending as elected members know the budget process is what commits us to the spending this is merely the lens on how we one of the lenses we can look through as an elected body on how that spending is to take place i'll remind members that this twenty thousand dollar budget that has produced this plan has resulted in real tang tangible savings Remember the street lights, remember the recommendations coming forward for the doing the street lights and what the payback period of that is. Was it five years, I think, until we start making that real saving of in the millions of dollars that we're talking about. This came from that working group. The electric vehicles um, discussion was had at the working group level and brought up to council. And I thank all members for those discussions, especially Councillor Kosh. Um, with his knowledge in that space. We have real chance here to approve a plan that will help the next elected body have what it needs to appropriately assess their first budget coming into their first term. You know, I heard tonight about we should stop waste, wasting ratepayer money um, on, these, on this because it doesn't exist. Believe in it or not, it really doesn't matter with the, with the savings that are available to us if we just follow what the plan tells us to follow. It tells us the how. The whens are up to the elected body. And the only reason we're moving this is purely because it was going to go to an audit committee meeting and unfortunately the timings didn't align. So this is just correcting the trajectory. So hopefully I can get elected members support on this. 
I believe is a, a clerical change to ensure that the direction is um, kept. But I'm happy to hear um, everyone else's feedback. I'm happy to second that motion. Yeah, look, happy to support the motion. I've been involved with the Climate Emergency Action Plan Committee from the start, and I've learned a lot from the independent experts on the panel, um, like Catherine Warhurst, who spoke during the public open forum tonight. And yeah, look, I've heard the criticism that of the plan that it's not in council's wheelhouse, um, that we're sort of interfering where we don't belong. Um, but to be clear, how we spend our electricity and our water and how many trees we plant and where we plant them, those are core council business. We're dealing in core council business here that, you know, now this is, where can we be more efficient? Where can we make savings? Where can we improve our processes? That's what this is. And look, you know, even if we were to suppose that climate change wasn't real, we would still be creating a better council if our footpaths had more tree shading and we had cleaner air. This is all, this is all good stuff that, that we're doing. Um, so, except the thing is there is climate change, it is real. And so it's even more important for us to do this. And yeah, I'd love to get this sorted out in this term of council. I don't think there's a particular point in dithering around for a few months and then dropping a big document on new councillors who haven't had the context of the regular updates that we've been, we've been getting. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to support this motion. Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor Hughes. Just a question through the chair, um, where we are at with the report that is supposed to be going to the audit committee member as per the original motion. Uh, the audit committee is coming up on the 6th of September. 6th of September. Uh, yep, thank you. Is it, is it possible to bring that forward by a couple of days or, or a day? Yeah. We could, well, we could yeah. discuss it and um, we haven't locked that um, in. We do, do need to talk to the... Um, uh, the independent members, thank you, Paul. I was trying to think of their title. Um, uh, we could we could look at the previous week, but the previous Tuesday's out. Uh, we do need to, we could look at another day, Paul, and bring it forward before caretaker and get some advice from the audit committee. Yeah. That is, I mean, that's possible. We just need to know that they're available. Yeah, I, I just see that as the sensible way forward is if we can get that um, that meeting uh, done by the six, um, I'm in favour of the special council meeting, but I, I just think um, it's, it's, it's very important, you know, as per the original motion, just you know, the whole, all of our consultation, everything was based on it going to the audit and risk committee. Staff are having a little bit of a discussion. Do you want to keep talking? Is do you want to explain further? Um, what? Yeah, no, I I agree um, that um, with with the rest of the motion, I, I I don't think there's been any intent by council to delay any of this work. Um, but it was always the original intent um, to actually go to the audit committee um, prior to make, actually making a decision. Um, I think if I say anything more, I'll be speaking for or against the motion. So. Okay, okay. Uh, any other discussion? Uh, you wanna keep talking? Yep. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep talking then. Um, yeah, I, I don't actually support uh, the rescind uh, part regarding the um, audit committee. I think it's actually vital. Um, it's something we've gone out for consultation to our community saying that we were actually going to do this and then not to do it uh, would not be very uh, responsible as councillors. Um, and I don't believe we're trying to delay any of this process at all. 
Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm happy for us to endorse the process, but I do think that the audit committee that are independent experts um, uh, can actually maybe actually give us some more of these uh, real costs and actually the savings that Councillor Shanks is talking about. They have expertise across um, all of local government. Um, they actually you know, have expertise in state government and private enterprise as well. They've, they've, we've got some really good independent members. Uh, we should get in the value out of those independent members. I think it's, it's vital. Um, we do have to be very careful uh, as councillors um, that um, you know, this is under the microscope, uh, the climate emergency process. And I, I don't think it would be a very good look for the process to actually bypass the audit committee uh, for our community to actually see us doing that as well. So um, as I said, I, I, I support us going through the process and I think we should hold the audit committee meeting before uh, the 6th of September and that way we can be fully informed and um, I think the process will, will go ahead um, the way it should be and it's the way we've consulted with our community otherwise we're uh, changing things at the last minute um, to suit um, certain criteria which I think is actually trying to bypass the audit committee which I don't think is, is a good Good process or, or good as, as councillors, as, as elected members, we do have responsibilities under the Local Government Act to act responsibly. And I think, Joe, this is one area that our community be watching very carefully. And I do think it, it actually will be of benefit to the climate emergency uh, plan uh, and to the endorsement probably of that, uh, that plan if it you know, goes through the audit committee, which I think is really important. So um, I just think that's something we can process um, internally as, as through council staff to make sure that the meeting's held beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I don't think we need to rescind is, is probably my last last uh, say on that. And I, I do you know, think that you know, there can be some major costs uh, to this process if, if we're not careful. Um, so that's that's why um, we I think the our independent uh, experts can actually give some actually really good clarification to the plan and the way forward, which hasn't been budgeted for at all. And um, I think that's important that uh, the monetary side of it be further explored. Thanks. So it is possible to have an audit committee before uh, and a special council meeting before caretaker. So it is possible to do both. We just need to make sure that the independent members uh, available, um, but it is it is possible. That is their job to be on our audit committee. And um, I think that uh, this is um, quite important. So it is possible to do both. Uh, Councillor Kosh, I think you're next. Um, well, I'll, I'll go to Councillor Kosh and then I'll go back to the mover. Um, he's probably thinking currently. Yep. Look, thanks, Mick. Look, I've got two concerns really about this motion. The first one is we're bypassing the audit committee. This will have costs. Um, it's not an aspirational plan. There are costs. So once you endorse this, there are actions and timeframes that we say that we will um, actually uh, do. And I'll go through some of those. Um, so that's my first, my first uh, concern. The second one is it's actually asking us to go to the next meeting and endorse this plan as it is, holes, bowlers. It's not saying that we're going to talk about it, we're going to modify it, we're not going to uh, up, update it. When, when you go through this plan, there's a whole lot of uh, things that have changed since when, uh, when the plan first was initiated. In, in goodwill, a lot of things were thought about and included in, in this plan, but we've, we've gone through, we've had investigations and the world has changed in, in, a, number of, in a number of ways. And a lot of these, a lot of the actions and the timeframes uh, just won't be achieved anymore. They just won't be achieved. So if you actually uh, pass this plan as it is, it's already outdated, actually. Um, and I'll go through a couple of them. But I just want to remind everybody that we're actually governed by the Local Government Act. And we've got some principles that we, ha that we have to observe as councillors. And I just really want to talk about um, Part eight, it's principles to be observed by council, and part C, part K, and it says 
ensure the sustainability of the council's long-term financial performance and position. Now, to do that, we really need to look at the costs that are involved in all our plans. In particular, we're looking at this one. So it's our duty and our function to actually um, to, to actually make sure that we understand the costs that are involved in this plan. If we don't, we're not doing our due diligence. We're not performing what I would call to be our core, one of our core principles as elected members, as in the council. Another, another one of our core um, principles is J, achieve and maintain standards of good public administration. I don't think by bypassing the audit committee, we're actually demonstrating good public administration. This is just ensuring that we go through the right steps. As I said before, it, 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 isn't, it isn't a free hit. I mean, it, it, is, it, it, isn't, it isn't costing us nothing. It would, cost us, it would cost us potentially. Now, I just wanted to go through a few of the issues I think that need to be revamped. The first one um, is we talk about um, goal eight, 100% renewable energy by 2023. That's on page... 74. That's what that's the plan says. We will be by 2023 100% renewable energy. Now we had a process that we were going to go through, and that that, that was going to actually actually achieve 100% potentially renewable energy by 2023. We now know that won't happen. We know that won't happen. So if we endorse this plan, in in essence, we'd go okay. It's 2023. We'll actually have to buy um, renewable energy off the market. Is that's, that's, what, that's, that's what this plan said. It's not aspirational at all. I've checked it. It's an aspiration. It does not say it's an aspirational plan. It says this is the plan. This is what we, this is what we will do. Voice, um, so potentially we're buying, buying that. We also talk about building large scale um, production of energy. We've had a plan on that. And I think there's going to be some solar panels built somewhere in council. We've got, I think we've actually had the investigations. We actually haven't had the report back yet, but I've, I've heard that it's going to cost a fair bit. We would then set in train that investment of a lot of money. So I think that's an issue. Uh, zero, goal nine, zero use of natural gas and LPG by 2025. So that's, that's in a, you know, three years time. And we're talking about essentially heat pumps at the swimming pool. Uh, and that is, and we talk about heat pumps at the swimming pool by 23, 24 season. Now we've had a consultant's report and I don't think the re consultant report is, is actually that um, favourable on it. I know that right from the start, we had this idea that it might be a like for like and it was a great idea. I actually supported it, I thought it was fantastic. But when you actually look at the reality, that won't happen. So that really needs to change. That's 30 seconds. Okay, second. okay. So green and ball at the same thing. Um, I think there's a problem. But so anyway, my view is that we should have a special council meeting and we should actually go through it and work out what's reasonable and what's not reasonable and what's actually changed since this was actually written. Because a lot of stuff has actually changed. And I think we do need to go to the audit committee, otherwise not doing our due diligence as councillors. And we're not, we're not actually conforming to their local government act. Thank you. Any other discussion, Councillor Goldstone? You can turn that yours on. Thank you. I'd just be interested in Councillor Shanks's feedback on the option of holding the uh, or bringing forward the audit committee and holding a special meeting because, I mean, if that can be done, surely that satisfies everyone's concerns. It, it does. Well, I think we should make ourselves available. We're councillors, that's our role. Uh, it's an important document. Uh, if this motion doesn't get up, I would expect that to happen anyway. So you, you don't wish to no, change I, it? No, I reckon this motion um, has its own merit. And when I close the debate, I'll, I'll point out some of these um, concerns. Um, but if it, doesn't, if it doesn't get up, well, then that's plan B. But yeah, this motion is standalone. Okay, so that's a no, yeah. I think. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gallows? Yeah, um, so just on... You've, you've already spoken. Yeah, well, I'm not speaking to the motion. I'm asking about uh, whether we could vary it. Um, just in terms of one of the points that Councillor Kosh raised about saying endorsing the CEP, I'm happy potentially for it to say make a decision on an endorsement of the CEP if that's clearer language, but it means the same thing. 
I think that's a fair call because I think it preempts a decision. And I, I think the wording could be improved in that regard. Uh, move to schedule a special meeting to, uh, uh, to, to make a determination on get rid of endorsement. I think the, the word endorsement preempts a decision make a determination on the, and I, I, I actually don't think we should use um, acronyms. We should actually use proper uh, words so that out of context, everybody knows. So it's climate emergency, not energy. And up the top there as well. I just think it's cleaner and everyone knows what you're talking about. Okay. Uh, so to make a determination, I think that covers off. Are you happy that with that? Thank you. Uh, any other discussion, Councillor Goldstone? Um, I'm just a bit concerned. I mean, I was, I'm happy to support the, the plan, but it seems to me that if this doesn't get up, there's no guarantee that that special meeting will be called or that the audit committee will be brought forward. Well, in my, in my I'm, opinion, I'm happy to accept it. We'll, I think we'll test the waters on Nathan's um, motion. Yeah. If it doesn't get up, there's an alternative motion, motion. that could be put. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other discussion? If not, uh, you, so you certainly, man, you certainly know. So if this is still bypassing the audit committee, is it? Yeah. Um, Councillor Shanks, you can close the debate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, members. Um, just, just to be clear, the endorsed language is what council use when a plan is presented back to us um, at this point of, well, of its completion. So I'm just using that language, but look, I'm happy to take on board um, that, that wording change. Um, elected members, I, I cannot stress enough that the state government has now called a climate emergency. Um, Gawler were the first council in South Australia to do it. Um, and we need our plan activated that we've been working on for two years. As Councillor Goldstone pointed out, um, he supports the plan. And I think we all have shown our support for this working group for this plan. Um, the audit committee sticking point is a new one. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit perplexed um, why this is a sticking point all of a sudden because we have so many plans that we've endorsed over our time and this is the first time I'm hearing it's a sticking point to go to the audit committee and the audit committee are a recommendation body to this council. I thank the audit committee for their expertise, their independent advice, but I think that advice needs to come at budget time. We do not commit to the spend by endorsing a plan or calling a special council meeting where we're going to make a decision on this plan. That's not what's happening here. Don't confuse the issue because we cannot make a spend until the budget process runs its course. And if we quote this plan in the budget process, then yes, the independent members are definitely well within their rights to make um, varied comments on those as we would through any other lens that council have commissioned to look through on our spends. We've listened tonight about where does the extra $14,000 come from? Our man with the money turned around and said, we're gonna have to figure out where that comes from the budget, $14,000. It was noted to talk about the budget. The budget process is what directs these actions. The plan is merely an idea on how to do them. And I'm not trying to downplay for the working group. I'm just trying to put it obviously, because I think, the, I think it's getting confused here. We take advice from the audit committee, which we thank them for, but we give the direction. We choose what to listen to and what to question. And also just to provide that extra layer of comfort for those that are a little bit confused here, look at point four of my motion. Point four is clearly talking about a report for the negative and positive financial outcomes that this plan potentially could bring into light for this council. 
sorry, the next council now, for this town. Let's not confuse it. Let's support this and let's get this back on track because this, this is a good motion, a way forward. And this gives us the control that we need for a plan that we've been working on for the last three years. And then on the spends, let's run the budget process and test it, test it on its merits. I really hope we can get some of the outcomes above the line, but that's up to the budget process and the elected members of the time to discuss. Uh, the debate is closed. I'll put that motion. All those in favour of the motion, please raise your hands. All those against, it is carried. Division. Um, all those in favour, please stand. Um, all those in favour of Councillor Davies, Councillor Goldstone, Councillor Vallalonga, Councillor Little, Councillor Shanks and Councillor Fraser. All those against are Councillor Kosh and Deputy Mayor Hughes. The motion is carried. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we'll have a five minute break uh, before we go any further um, so we can have a toilet break. Thank you, everyone. We'll come back at uh, 10, 5 to 9. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, he voted for it. I named him. Yeah. Yeah. No. No, it wasn't Hughes, it was Shanks. It was Shanks.
Okay, we might um, get moving if everyone can take their seats. Thank you. Um, we'll keep keep moving. Thank you. So we'll get started. And uh, the next item is 10.3 uh, on page 20 of the... Um, okay, we've got an officer's recommendation there. Be happy to move that way, Councillor Fraser. Yes, I'm happy to move this. Um, looking at the map, I think that will work quite well by the looks of it. Um, I personally am not in favour of mirrors. They get fogged up and you can't sit, you know, they're very difficult to see anyway. Um, you get sun on them and they reflect, although I guess they're put in a certain direction, so that doesn't happen. But it, it possibly can happen. So I, I'm more than happy with that. Do I have a seconder for that, Councillor Vallelonga? Any discussion, Councillor Shanks? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Yeah, I'm for this, and I, I agree with Councillor Fraser. I understand there is a place um, for those convex mirrors, um, but nine out of ten that I see are usually all scratched up um, and graffitied, um, which isn't ideal. Um, I like this solution um, because it is it's low cost, and you know we have that petition that's come through from these residents, and we are providing that action. Um, I do warn that this may come up again in a, another street um, elsewhere, but you know, acting on these sorts of things and, and going out to the public and asking, are they all good with this? I think they have pretty much come back and said, yes, look, that, that may work. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to support this um, and yeah, we'll, let's get it in. Any other discussion? If not, Councillor Fraser, are you happy for me to put the motion? I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Carried unanimously. Uh, 10.4, I didn't abstain. I didn't abstain. Yeah, I don't know why they, that does that. Um, Okay, so 10.4 on page 24, we've got a, a recommendation. Happy to move that way, Councillor Goldstone, seconded by Councillor Vallelonga. Uh, any discussion? If not, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, policy review, 10.5 on page 26. Uh, you happy to move that way, Councillor Vallelonga? Do I have a second to Councillor Little? Any discussion? If not, I'm going to put that motion. All those in favour, carried unanimously. Thank you. Sports lighting, strategic supply agreement, sports lighting. There's an officer's recommendation on page 28. How are we going? You happy to move that way? Thank you, Councillor Goldstone. Seconded by... Councillor Valor Longa. Any discussion? Councillor Shanks. Um, oh, I'm interested in this um, and I, I like where the thinking's at, um, but I'm just not sure if I'm across the line on the support um, of pre purchasing these sorts of, the, these sorts of assets. Um, I guess I'm just going by some experience um, on clients purchasing items and having them installed um, by contractors and uh, the crossover of workmanship warranty, uh, manufacturer warranty. Um, I note that in the, the report, it does talk about um, how that's going to be tried to be mitigated. Um, but in my experience, what happens is when something goes faulty and you've got two different parties, the the installer says it's the product's fault and the product supplier says it's the installer's fault. Um, you know, I, I know that's a bit of sceptical um, view there, but that's what I do um, see happen um, from time to time when we supply our contractors with items. Um, so 
I think I support the recommendation purely because uh, I wouldn't mind seeing what the tender actually brings back and it does feed into F, the further report that we'll be discussing a bit later on. Um, but look, I congratulate uh, Wendy and the team for this is the sort of outside of the box thinking that I think um, is warranted in the, in the current climate. Uh, any other discussion? So it was moved by Councillor Goldstone and seconded by Councillor Vallalonga. Is it up there? Okay. Um, any other discussion? If not, uh, Councillor Goldstone, are you happy for me to put the motion? I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Carriage unanimously. Thank you. So now we move on to uh, information reports and we can move these on block if we wish. Councillor Vallalong, are you happy to move them on block? So you're moving 11.1, 2, 3 and 4. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Fraser. So we've got a mover and a seconder. Any discussion? Councillor Shanks. Um, yeah, I'll just speak to the one. Um, state of the market. Yep. Yes. Um, this report does capture the state of play. Um, there is no argument from me there. We talked about the last motion being outside the box thinking. I think that is, that is the start. I know when I read this report, I know. I want to know what we're going to do about it because this information isn't new and it is affecting our ability to be able to deliver on budget. Now, I'm not asking, asking for the answers tonight, but we need to be able to come up with a way to adapt as other companies are. Uh, we, we need to figure it out because there's a solution to these problems and what we supply in council is actually very small in comparison to what goes on in the construction industry as a whole. So I applaud staff for looking at the procurement idea of the, of the lights. That is that sort of thinking that I, I think is a really good direction to start looking into. This information report brings, I think, the rest of the councillors up to speed of what's actually going on factually. Um, and I thank staff for it, but we need to be able to figure out what next, what are we going to do about it? Um, so, look, I'm happy to um, note all this um, because it's not telling me anything I, I don't know, um, but it is good to see it in writing. Thank you. Uh, if there's no further discussion, uh, Councillor Vallalonga, are you happy for me to put the motion? Um, I'll, before I do, I'd just like to commend the finance team on another favourable um, operating variants. Um, well done to you and your team, uh, Paul Horde. Um, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands, carriage unanimously. Thank you. So now we're moving on to recommendations from the committee and I'll work through them. Uh, and I'm starting on page 56 of our agenda. Um, Recommendations from the Gawley Youth uh, Advisory Committee held on the 1st of August. We've got a Youth Development Officer update. Are you happy to move that way? Councillor Davies, seconded by Councillor Shanks. Any other discussion? If not, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, carriage unanimously. Single use plastics report. Are you happy to move that way, Councillor Shanks? Seconded Councillor Davies. Any discussion, Councillor Davies? <laughs> Um, just as a general comment to say that I think the our Youth Advisory Committee has been working really well um, lately in a range of the people on the committee being able to uh, get involved in a range of different topics. We've had um, our new chair, Jade Hancock, uh, gave a presentation in public open forum earlier, as well as Jack Gill, who's also on the committee. Um, and we have, a, we have a range of people who are all getting the chance to um, get involved and take a look at their interests and um, that's why we're getting um, stuff out of the, the yak now about single use plastics and climate action and other issues that young people care about. Any other discussion? If not, I'll um, put that motion. All those in favour, 
encourage unanimous law. Item 7.3, got a recommendation uh, in regard to uh, sports person and youth artist sponsorship program. Happy to move that way, Councillor Shanks, seconded by Councillor Vallelonga. Any discussion? If not, I'm going to put that motion. All those in favour, carriage unanimously. Thank you. So moving on to the Infrastructure and Environmental Services Committee meeting held on the 9th of August. 12.2 uh, is uh, motions made under delegated authority for noting. So we're just noting these adopted motions. Moved by Councillor Vallelonga, seconded by Councillor Goldstone. If there's no further discussion, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, carriage unanimously. Moving over to 12.2.1, asset management plans. Uh, we had a good discussion at the uh, committee meeting around these. I'm happy to move that way, Councillor Kosh. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Little, thank you. Uh, if there's no further discussion, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, carriage unanimously. Stormwater management plans update. Equally uh, interesting discussion held at the uh, committee meeting. Uh, we do have a recommendation from the committee. You're happy to move that way. Thank you, Councillor Shanks. Seconded, Councillor Vallelonga. If there's no further discussion, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, carriage unanimously. Thank you. Over the page, we have the Gawler Heritage Collection Committee meeting held on the 11th of August, 2022. And I'll go through these. We have uh, motions made under delegated authority for noting, which is 12.3 on page 60. So that's for noting. You happy to move that way, Councillor Davies? And I'll, I can see Councillor Vallelonga's hand up, seconded. Uh, and that's a noting motion. Do you wish to speak to that? Thank you, Councillor Davies. Yeah, well, just on the, on the bunyip, um, I think it would be, It'd be great to get some um, some of the recent years of the Bunyip um, used to be available, but they changed over their website. And so the 2014 to 2021, I think, has, uh, has disappeared from the internet. It might be good to talk with the Bunyip about, about some of these that are already digitized, but are um, simply not up available on the internet anywhere right now. Thank you. If there's no further discussion, um, Councillor Ballalonga, you're happy for me to put that motion? I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands. It is carried unanimously. Thank you. Moving over to page 61, request for permission to publish Murray Street maps. And there is a recommendation from the committee that permission be granted. You're happy to move that way, Councillor Kosh, and seconded Councillor Ballalonga. Any discussion? If not, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, carried unanimously. Request for permission to publish Monster Fair poster. Councillor Kosh, you're happy to move that way. Councillor Vallelonga is seconded. If there's no further discussion, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, carried unanimously. Thank you. Request for permission to publish EH Coombe items. You're happy to move that way, Councillor Kosh. I've got a seconder in Councillor Vallelonga. If there's no further discussion, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, carried unanimously. Thank you. I'm over the page to external body reports that concludes the committee recommendations. There are no external body reports. There are no questions on notice. You had some questions without notice. Would you like to present them? Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I had some questions around the dog park, um, specifically in regards to um, the area that's been fenced off because um, it's become muddy because the dogs have worn up all the grass and what the progress was on that and whether there were some, you know, what solutions were available um, and how the how residents are gonna find out about it. Yes, thank you, Wendy. Wendy Young. The reader chair, yes, thanks, Councillor Davies. So the large dog park is currently closed for maintenance. So as you say, that it's become mother muddy and the dogs have dug it up quite a bit. So at the moment we're trying to go through a restoration process. So we are trying to re-establish the turf in there. Unfortunately, because it has been so wet and cold, it's just going really slow at the moment. So we don't want to open it until we have got the grass back to a good level so that the dogs can go in and not just dig it straight up, straight back up again. Um, the community consultation for the dog park, which has just been approved as we've gone through the IS um, recommendations, 
Um, I'll send out an email to let you members about that tomorrow. We're set to go live for that on Thursday this week. And we'll have other information, including about the, the closure of the park for maintenance within that process. Thank you. Does that address your questions? Thank you. Any other questions uh, without notice, Councillor Sheikhs? Um, yeah, I've, I've just been sent through one. Um, what is the status of the Gawla Entry Beautification Works? Um, there was project funding that came out of the report to upgrade the southern entry to Gawla Roundabout. Um, is there any status update on that? Can you answer that or do you want to take it on notice? Oh, you've just turned your mic off, turn it on again. There you go. Through the chair again. So we have just gone through our tender process for the two roundabout beautification projects. Um, we're just in our final negotiations with our preferred tenderer um, to work within budget for that. Mm -hmm. um, the design for the main entry statements is very behind schedule, um, mainly because we lost our landscape coordinator who was leading that. Um, and I've had to throw a lot of other work at our new landscape coordinator. So roundabouts are progressing. So that's the roundabout at the Red Banks Road and Main North Road intersection in Williston, near the big BP and the Williston Hotel. And then the smaller roundabout at the intersection of Sixth Street and Adelaide Road. Um, we've got designs if people are interested in seeing the designs for those roundabout landscaping. I'll have to get back to you on what the tenders Tender as program was. So, so the question was timelines, just so people can hear. Um, uh, and you're going to get back to us. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to Kate, Councillor Fraser. The um, screening on the Gawler Bridge, um, on the Mill, Gawler Mill Bridge, and how's that coming along? So we've got the budget in this financial year approved to progress that. Um, at the moment, it's just about getting the staff to go through the tender process for the um, workshop drawings and fabrication. Um, so it's in the board procurement plan. Um, we'll see how we can go over the next six months. I'd hope it's in the next six months. Yep. Thank you. I think that concludes some um, questions without notice. Uh, now, motions on notice uh, 16.1, Councillor Shanks. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, the club president was hoping to be here and speak in public open forum, but he's just sent me a couple of notes that I'm just going to read out quickly um, and then I'll, I'll move the motion. Um, the Gawler District Tennis Association remain very grateful for Mayor Redmond's original motion um, to help support our uh, association. We just wish to change the Town of Gawler support to a cash donation to engage Cotton Media, who are a sports media specialist, um, and they're locally based. We've received an outstanding 12 months marketing proposal, which includes two static posts post weekly, including captioning and appropriate hashtags, two reels created using video content captured and posted weekly, including captioning and appropriate hashtags, the per annum cost is around 6760 and the GDTA um, contribution to the remaining 1760 This is a best in market marketing deal and the most efficient use of Town of Gawler contribution. We look forward to co-branding with Town of Gawler to grow tennis in the region. We see this as a major step as we build ourselves towards the Town of Gawler master plan. The Gawler, um, the GT, GDTA is about to agree to terms with one of SA's most prominent tennis coaching uh, academies who will be basing themselves in Essex Park. This is a major um, win for the Gawler um, Tennis Association. The Exchange Hotel is also a major financial and in-kind contributor to ensure the successful of this academy coming to Gawler. The strategic plan that the Tennis Association um, is in its infancy is actually on track to achieve all its goals and metrics. Um, now that was the presentation that the, the new chair of the um, Tennis Association was going to give. But I think the points that are made are, are so very- Move your motion and talk to your motion now, if that's yeah, okay. Yeah that's, what I, yeah, that's what I'm doing, yep. yep. Um, so I think um, the, points that have been made by, by the president 
are very clear. They have a direction, um, they appreciate the sport, their support, and with a minor tweak, tweak of how we are going to provide that support, they are going to be able to engage the correct media company to be able to deliver on their, um, their, their plans that they have in place. Um, I think this is actually timed well as well, given the fact that our digital marketing officer position is, is now empty and looking to be filled. Um, that doesn't stop um, the struggle that this local sporting club is in. And that's why we did support this motion back in January. This is, um, again, just changing up the way we give the money. It's still the same money. I can't stress that enough. It's still the same money but it's going to be spent in an efficient way with a marketing company that specializes in sports media. So I hope we can get some support um, for the chamber. Um, you know, we, we did just support a sporting club in a previous motion. We are already supporting this club. It's merely just changing the style of support. So I hope I can get all elected members support and I look forward to the discussions to come. Do I have a seconder, uh, Councillor Davies? Yeah, I think um, the Tennis Association seems to be doing well in um, trying to spruik up some interest again. Um, they've had a, um, a Wednesday night um, $5 um, thing during the winter where anyone can come in. And I've gone down a couple of times now when it's not raining. Um, and um, I think, look, Marketing, I think that all sounds reasonable to me. In my experience with marketing, usually they charge you 10 times the amount and then set up a LinkedIn and go home. Um, so to hear that, you know, for a small price, they're going to have a reasonable, you know, annual sort of uh, system there. It's, it, sounds, it sounds like it's something um, targeted to them that's good that they've found. Um, so, yeah, happy to support this. Discussion. Councillor Kosh. Look, unfortunately, I'm not happy to support this. This is actually a sponsorship deal for the tennis club. So we're opening up again the floodgates for every every sporting organisation in town to say, "Well, we want sponsorship too. We want we want this. We want that." What this is is an in-kind contribution from council. When you convert it into cash, it is a real cost. It comes out of another budget. We we were envisaging that we would use council staff to do this. And that's what we should be doing, providing the support, the in-kind support. We've provided in-kind support to other clubs and they've been very successful, like the soccer club, and even, and for example, working with the show society. We, are, we can be very effective in in-kind support. I'm, 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 so I'm not, I'm not happy to convert that into cash because it, it, is a, a, it is more expenditure on the budget. And you would just have more and more, more and more clubs putting their hand out and saying, "We want the same sponsorship deal." It will never end. Thank you. Any other discussion? If not, Councillor Shanks, are you happy to close the debate? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, we are already sponsoring and supporting this club by offering in-kind support. Employee costs are a real cost. We don't have staff here because they like to be here. They are paid to be here. Well, sorry, I'm sure some staff <coughs> like to be here, but, but you are paid to be here. That is a real cost. You've been involved in many budget processes now, and you will know that our staffing costs are around 12 to $14 million per year of real money. That money gets funded by ratepayers and that money gets expended on staff. That staff, that position, a digital marketing officer was created. It is now not currently filled. This deal that Councillor Davies has pointed out as being value for money is way better value than what we would be able to pursue as a council. I can't stress that enough. As I've pointed out in my preamble, the tennis club have elected a new president who was able to lean on their relationships to get a sweetheart deal and spend that money more efficiently than we can on staff. Our staff are spread thin as it is, as we're told in multiple times. 
So instead of putting this impost on them, let's do a sponsorship deal this way instead of the sponsorship deal we all agreed to in January, noting that it's still the same amount, it's just a different way of spending it. And let's support this community club because that's what we should be doing. So I hope this motion can get up and we can show the support that we should around this great community club that as Councillor Davies has pointed out, seeming that it has a good trajectory because they are committing their own time and money into it. In a difficult time that we all were presented to back in January, nothing's changed. They're still up against it. We're just changing the way we're going to help them. Not the amount, just changing the way. Uh, the debate is closed. I'm gonna put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands. All those against, it's carried. Uh, Councillor Shanks has called a division. All those in favour, please stand and I'll call your names out. Uh, that is Councillor Davies, Councillor Vallelonga, Councillor Little, Councillor Shanks, Councillor Fraser. All those against are Councillor Kosh. The motion is carried, thank you. Uh, now, Councillor Shanks, 16.2 on page 64. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, look, this is just a tweak to our policy. Um, I'm not going to try, I'm not going to bog everyone down here. Um, it's merely giving the um, opportunity for those who want it to um, present a thousand words in their preamble instead of a 200 words. Um, I think I've provided a good example on when some more words is valuable. And if you don't think it is valuable, then it's, you're well welcome not to read the preamble and listen to the debate. There is really nothing lost. Um, I also sent through an example of what a thousand words looks like. It's, it's a page and a half of typed words. It's actually four pages. It's 250 words a page. So, so I sent through an example of a thousand words and it was a page and a half with the correct spacing, but anyway. Okay. Four pages in an a thousand um, page agenda with attachments is not really a big deal, is it? Anyway, look, we're getting sidetracked here. What I'm talking about is allowing the opportunity to an elected member to be able to articulate why they may be moving a motion because we move motions for the best of our community, right? So why not allow the opportunity of changing 200 words to a thousand words to allow that elected member to present their motion to not only this chamber, but to the community. And what you do do is you actually manage to pick up some efficiencies that people may not want to speak the full five minutes, but until I was interrupted, I'm now rambling a little bit. Um, but it speaks for itself. And I hope we can get some support here because you have nothing to lose. Uh, Councillor Davies. Yeah, look, I mean, I understand why there has to be some limit, but 200 words just seems like childproofing for some reason, like, you know, just making sure that we don't, open the door in the middle of the highway and tumble out. Like, you know, we sometimes we need words to be able to explain motions because they're detailed motions. I would not have understood Councillor Shanks's motion about, um, you know, drilling holes and all this kind of thing that he's an expert in, um, you know, without a detailed explanation. Um, and sometimes you need a detailed explanation because the motion is detailed, so I'm happy to support this. Okay, so Kosh, you had your hand up first. Yep, thanks. Um, I, I actually write professionally, that's my job. If you can't write succinctly in 200 words, there's an issue because what happens after 200 words, people lose concentration and um, yet they, they fall away. There's a bit of a guide that says you should only have three main points in whatever you write, no more than five, um, because they, they do that. So when people read it, they can order that in their mind and uh, they, they can understand the argument. When you get over, when you start getting to a third, you know, more than that, like a thousand words, people are lost, they're absolutely lost. They, they don't understand the thread. You've gone more than five points. 
uh, it just gets confusing and it doesn't benefit anybody. Um, you, you really, what, what, you, what you need to do is just be able to write succinctly for 200 words and you'll get your point across without any problem at all. Because the, what, what I found, I've been writing for over 20 years now, what I found is more is less when it comes to writing. You know, I, I could write forever uh, on a topic and get nowhere, whereas what I do now is write a little bit on something and get a long way. So um, that's just a point of view from someone who writes as professionally that you really need to, you need to have it succinctly, keep it to three points, maybe five. But once you go over three, people are lost. It's just, and then all of a sudden you, you do, it just rambles, unfortunately. And that's what happens. Thank you. Councillor Fraser. Um, Councillor Shanks can ask a question. How many words are in this? In this preamble? Pardon? How much? It's over 200. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know about a thousand words. I think a thousand words is too many. Um, uh, cause, because what will happen is that you have all that in there, but then when it comes to presenting the motion, you're going to talk to it anyway. So then you're going to take, you know, another three minutes to talk about it. So, yeah, I, no, I just I think um, 300 would be all right, but not not a thousand. Any other discussion, Councillor Bellawonga? Um, can we make it 500, Nathan? You might get your motion up, Nathan, if you change it. Okay. okay. <laughs> sure, no problem. That's a no. Um, yeah, yep. Yeah. Any other discussion? If not, uh, Councillor Shanks, you happy to close the debate? Um, yeah, look, a couple of points. Um, officers, I hope you're listening because I expect every report to only be 200 words from now on. Um, because obviously that's all we need. Um, Bunyip reporters, I expect all your um, reports to be 200 words from now on because that's all you need. Um, look, I don't write professionally, um, nor do I have the time to get lessons um, to be able to congest everything. Um, I do um, know how to quickly type and it doesn't take me long to do so. My preambles are purely to be able to explain the point I'm trying to make and a thousand words is very, very small in comparison to what we as elected members are expected to read. And also, <coughs> I'm not forcing you to read my preambles. You can ignore them if you like, that's fine. But it allows me to structure my argument, not only for this chamber, but for the record on why I'm moving a particular motion. If I need 300 words, give me 300 words. If I need 1,000 words, give me 1,000 words. The car club situation that we all agree was beneficial to be able to report on some technical advice was well over 500 words. You have nothing to lose by allowing those of us that want to be able to communicate their point, whatever way they want to, because they haven't learnt about the three points and writing succinctly, and I'm, I'm more than happy to take that feedback on, on board, but I don't have the professional writing experience. I know how to communicate using the words that I need to communicate, and I shouldn't have a cap as one of the board of directors when we don't cap staff. That makes no sense to me. So allow the next chamber to articulate the reason that they may choose to move any motion. Allow them the opportunity to, and who knows, they might not use it. You've got nothing to lose. So I'm gonna put that motion. All those in favor, please raise your hands. All those against, it's carried. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kosh, we've got a motion. You could. Yes, I've got a three-part motion. It's up there. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, yep. Okay, it's public, so this is to do with Norma. It's public knowledge that the landfill site at Eulabri will close most likely in May 2026. Yeah, this was recorded in our in the the Norma's business plan that was adopted um, at our July council meeting. Um, so, so as you can see, that, that when you read that statement, uh, that you can see that Norma is working on landfill alternatives with a specialist working group fo focusing on on this. It's a priority considering the closure uh, of Eulabri in May 2026. Um, also, there's an ongoing, there's been ongoing reporting to Norma for about one and a half to two years, and you only need to look at the, the, the minutes to see that. Um, what's important is that we look at look at all the options and we consider them. That's that's very important. Uh, it must be kept in context that an alternative to Eulabri is a big undertaking. You're looking at large amounts of red bin waste that must be processed in an effective and efficient way. For any project to become reality, you move through a um, conceptual stage, looking at the different parts or elements and determine if they're feasible. You then become more specific as you move forward. So you need to have a lot of different pieces all fitting into, into together. This includes a need for a lot of conversations and investigations. On a, an alternative view of B will not exist on paper, but it will have a physical form using a particular method at a particular location. It will be somewhere in a community and it will have neighbours. These alternatives will have a very, very long lifespans. So once it, once it is in place, it is there for the long term. The process of investigating these alternatives is not a cheap exercise. There's a great deal of financial investment. But if you find that the community in particular, in a particular location are not supportive of, of, of the proposal, it may be very, very difficult to move forward as you need what is called social licence. Obtaining that social license is just as important as the other pieces that make up this, this a successful project. So you could, you could continue on having discussions across the board in confidence, and then get to a point where the community says they don't want the alternative in their neighbourhood. You can see a lot, this would be a lot of wasted resources and time to arrive at an alternative. I feel it is now time for Norma Board, given what I consider to be the maturity of the investigation, to, um, to decide to bring the community on board now and include those, include them in the conversation. In some respects, by continuing on, you and others are presuming when you're having these conversations that the community is, will be supportive of having a particular alternative cited in their community. This may not necessarily be the case. You only need to look at the history around Eulabri. When it was first moved to it, there was a strong community opposition about its establishment. People then and even now are not convinced about the assurances provided at the time. They're still concerned about it and there is strong community resistance. There was strong community resistance around the process of extending the current license. Even now the residents around the site are essentially counting down the days till it closes. So Norma has recent history in the way that it consults the community. The pitfalls and the ongoing going angst within neighbourhoods which facilitated where facility, facilities located. So given this history, why would we think it may be any different in this case? My view is to get on the front foot, include the community in the conversations, uh, as the current conversations that are happening around them about citing potential facilities in their neighbourhood. So as, as Norma, so as the Norma, as the, as the Norma board members, they have set, they have a set of responsibility around the strategic direction of Norma, ensuring the objectives and the, and, and those that they are achieved managing risk and using resources effectively and which and and also being accountable in this case normal board needs to ensure that there is a viable, a viable alternative to Eurobri when it closes uh, whatever the alternative is it must have community support otherwise i think it will struggle to be a viable option they must expand resources effectively but more resources can be spent on investigators etc which may not lead to, which may not, may not be receiving community support. Finally, they must be accountable to the community. If, the, if you continue on having conversation and investigations, knowing that a particular alternative is a distinct possibility without talking to the affected community, I feel it is hardly being accountable. Any investigation needs to be, needs, needs to be a full consideration of the option. Community consultation is essential for these considerations. People within neighbourhoods are making decisions now. Is that, is that up there? 
Keep going. Yep, yep, yep. It's people within neighbourhoods are making decisions now without the knowledge that a facility could potentially be built within their midst. It will be their communities that will be directed impact, directly impacted one way or another and live day to day with the implications of the alternative being within their neighbourhood. They will be the ones that, we, that will, will, will be providing the social licence. So this motion is asking the normal board to begin meaningful community consultation now, given the maturity of the investigation, the needs to, this needs to be done to ensure the whole process has been accountable and transparent. So the motion is in three parts. And this is, a, this is a motion requesting action from the normal board, because the normal board up to now has maintained all the discussions around the, uh, these, these alternatives in confidence. So things are happening, but the community doesn't know. So first, first part is to provide a public available report, just summarising the investigations to date regarding the alternative to landfill, including the preferred process and location. Uh, authorise community consultation on the different alternatives to begin. This consultation to be meaningful and broad ranging. Uh, use the feedback from the community consultation as a guide to best utilise um, the allocated funds for the landfill investigations. Because what can happen is stuff can happen and the people don't know. It. Okay, okay, fair enough. Yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you, okay. thank you, Councillor Kosh, yep. and seconded by Councillor Ballalonga. Thank you. Uh, yes, as long as it's broad ranging. And ask a question to um, yeah, Councillor Kosh. The Norma Board have a reason why this is kept in confidence. What is the reason? And can we ask them to break that? If you look at the publicly available minutes, it talks about it being commercially important that it kept, it's kept in confidence. That's the reason. It's a commercial reason. Is that because of finances or because they don't want the public to know where it's going? So I think we'll, I think, I think we'll, we won't be, we, I think there's some there's some issues around um, potentially breaching confidentiality. So I, I don't think you should answer that. Um, yeah, I would I would recommend you not answer that with all due respect, Councillor Fraser. Uh, okay, so uh, we've got to move it and we've got to second it. Any other discussion on this matter, Councillor uh, Little? Yeah, I interrupted because we were going to breach confidentiality. Um, I agree with some of the parts, especially about Ulibri and all that, because the consultation, I was in the initial process for that, even though it was drawn out and there were some issues, some good things come out of it. So I agree that we need to do that because out of some of those consultations those days, there was a lot of negatives, but there was also some positives. So we need to get the broad look at both sides of the picture. So I'm quite happy with it, even though it took council cost about two hours to get across. No, um, I agree with the concept because we need to have a broad, overview of everybody who's interested in what we're doing. Norm, Norm is a great organisation and I want to keep it that way. Thank you. Any, uh, if there's no further discussion, Councillor Kosh, are you happy for me to put the motion? Do you yes. want to say anything else? No. no. Okay. Uh, I'm going to put that motion. We all understand what we're voting on up on the screen there. All those in favour, please raise your hands. All those against, it is carried. Thank you. Uh, so that that concludes the motions on notice. Uh, motions without notice. Council member attendances and activities. Normally I have something, but I haven't been, I haven't got it tonight. So I, I'm not actually prepared. <laughs> um, we do have the goal show this weekend and I'd encourage everyone to go. Um, there's lots of really great activities. Uh, I think it's back in August, which I think is fantastic. The Horses in Action will be there, two-day show. So please, uh, if people are listening, please um, go along to, and support this fabulous uh, community event. Uh, and I think the weather's going to be fine, I've been told. Uh, so I think it will be uh, marvellous. I'll leave it at that. Any other um, attendances.
Yeah, I went along this morning to um, an official launch of the new facilities uh, for Gola and District College. Um, the new Minister for Education, Blair Boyer, was there to officially sort of open the, the plaque because they've had a, a pretty large, I think, $10 million investment in that school, um, which, you know, really, um, they really benefit from. Um, I think our public schooling really um, could use a, a lot more funding in, in some areas. Um, but yeah, we went down to their outdoor sort of in cover auditorium area and it was it was quite good. And that was one of the areas that they've, they've built. Um, so I'm glad to see that um, that all went successfully and they have some great new facilities over at Gullen District. Uh, I went to the View Club 19th birthday uh, party at the Kingsford Hotel where Tony Hanna talked about the history of the Kingsford Hotel, which was always really, really interesting. And I also went and had a look at um, uh, the Giannito family at the Gawler Arms Hotel, the new accommodation, which um, Gawler, uh, your company, Nathan, is uh, project managing and they're doing a, an excellent job and it's going to be outstanding when it's finished. And uh, yeah, they're very, very excited about uh, that, which is brand new accommodation in the heart of the main street. So I just sort of mentioned that. Um, okay, uh, right. Um, so now uh, any other council member attendances have been none. We'll move on to, um, confidential reports and we have um, a recommendation on page 67 uh, to go into confidence and this is um, recommendations from the infrastructure and environmental services committee are you happy to move that way councillor fraser councillor shanks i saw your Name up. Do you want to explain why we're going into confidence? Um, Thank you. Yes, because of the information disclosure of which could reasonably be expected to confer a commercial advantage on a person with whom the council is conducting or proposing to conduct business. Thank you. Uh, if there's no further discussion, we've got a mover and a seconder. Uh, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands. It's carried unanimously. So thank you, uh, Brendan. Um, and I don't actually know your name, but uh, Kayla, nice to 